my name is Per Wiesen. I work at the Swedish House of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. And together with SNS, we do this seminar series. And we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, and when you make seminar series like this, you always have a sort of a wish list, a list of 10 or 15 seminars you'd love to do. And sometimes you manage to do them and sometimes you don't. And, and Greece, and, or rather Greece and Europe, sort of Greece and how Europe managed to handle the 2011 crisis and, and uh, has been high on the list for a long time. Uh, and early this summer, this year, I came across a book called Game Over by somebody I didn't know at the time. Uh, and I read the book and I loved it. It was a very good book. And I thought, wow, we got to find a way to make him come to Stockholm uh, and talk to us. And he is here. His name is George Con Papa Constantinou. Uh, and he was Minister of Finance. 2011, no, 29 to 2011. Um, so he was really in the middle of the most hectic phase of all of this. Um, and he's today working as a consultant advisor uh, and touring with a book a bit, I understand. Uh, and we are very happy to have him here. He has promised to talk for like 30 minutes or so. Uh, you can take it a bit longer if you want to, but then we will have plenty of time for questions or comments. I mean, you don't have to uh, ask a question. You can sort of say what you feel or comment or discuss or debate or whatever. That's perfectly okay. So very much welcome, all of you, and very much welcome, George. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. It's a... Great pleasure to be here, and many thanks to the Swedish House of Finance and SNS for inviting me. Is can you can hear this? I'm trying to get used to this because it's very high tech. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, all right. So, I wrote this book, and this is a book that can be read in a number of ways. It is, uh, first of all, you know, people write books for themselves. You know, you shouldn't believe anyone who says, I wrote the book for the great... The, the first person you write a book is for yourself, because you need to put things down. And in my case, I went through a dramatic period for my country and a dramatic period for myself. So at the end of it, I felt that I simply had to write it down. I had to put it on paper, or rather on a keyboard... Uh, which is what I did. I like to tell people that uh, I wrote it in English before I wrote it in Greek. And this was because I needed the emotional distance from the material. And after having written it in English, of course, I thought, well, I can't publish this in English before I publish it for the Greek audience. So I rewrote it in Greek. So you have two books. They're pretty much the same uh, for those of you that want to compare. Uh, <laughs> But the, the Greek one is slightly longer because there's some detail on the internal cuisine, so to speak, uh, that you know, to a non-Greek reader is not that interesting. So there's a first level at which this book can be approached, which is a, it's, it's a personal uh, testimonial and um, kind of a, a, a cautionary tale in politics. I started off, uh, I became finance minister in 2009, this was my first, I was a member of parliament before, but this was my first government job. So I was thrown right in, in the deep. At the time of the job, I was probably the second best known and more, most popular person in, in Greek politics after the prime minister. Two years later, I was persona non grata in my country. Um, I was blamed for everything that we went through. I even ended up in front of a court. Uh, the fact that I'm here talking to you today means that this kind of ended reasonably well. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Uh, but even that aspect, which is a very personal aspect, uh, which shows you some of the least savory parts of Greek politics, is in the book. It's the last two chapters. But of course, beyond the personal stuff, this is, uh, it's, it's a narrative about a country 
that found itself in 2009 in an impossible situation, uh, the result of uh, mismanagement for a very long time, problems that were very deep, and uh, it crashed. And the book is ha- about how we dealt with it, how, you know, first of all, why we got there, um, what happened blow by blow, how uh, we dealt with it. And there you have the interaction, of course, between uh, Greek officials and Europe. And I think that's part of the more the more interesting part of the book, perhaps, for a non-Greek reader. And where we are today and looking forward, what can one hope uh, for the country, given that uh, it's been seven years and we're still in a recession uh, and we're still not out of it. And, of course, it's a book uh, which I would like to think helps people understand how Europe works, not how it's supposed to work. Not how the treaties and the institutions tell you it should work, but how it really works. Meaning how we make it up as we go along. Because frankly, from 2009 onwards, we rewrote the rule book. Uh, and we rewrote it under uh, duress. We rewrote it in a situation where uh, European policymakers, the larger countries, uh, the Commission, the ECB, basically found themselves in a situation they thought was never possible. And they try to handle it by uh, being creative. Uh, and uh, it is a story of how they handled it, how they mishandled it in many cases, because some of the decisions taken were really not, let's, to put it politely, first best decisions. Uh, they were second best at best. Uh, and how this Eurozone crisis can be blended and understood in the broader almost existential crisis that we're living in Europe at the moment. So um, that's a bit of a tall order to to say that the book uh, addresses it. But I think that by going through the uh, actual events in these six years, seven years, uh, because the book starts in 2009 with a bit of a flashback and ends up in 2015, you get a real sense of uh, the decision-making process uh, or lack thereof uh, in Europe uh, at the time. So, many people have asked me um, about the title. You know, it's, it's a very pessimistic title, Game Over. It's actually a phrase that Jean-Claude Juncker uh, used uh, in uh, November 2009 when, um, in my uh, first uh, appearance in front of the Eurogroup, I actually announced to the world that the fiscal deficit of the country was double what people thought. It was not six, it was 12 and a half. It ended up 15 and a half, but at the time we didn't know that. And uh, his frustration was encapsulated in a phrase, you know, it's game over, we need serious statistics for Greece. Uh, but of course it's a bit of a metaphor. It is, I, I am very quick to say, not game over for Greece, and I do not think it's game over for Europe. But it is game over certainly for a way of doing things. Uh, for Greece it's game over for a state that had no idea what it was spending and where and uh, how it was supposed to be collecting taxes. And it is game over for an economy that was for a very long time built on borrowing and importing and didn't know how to export uh, and how to face a very competitive international environment. So in that sense, it's game over. It's also game over for a political system which was self-serving Uh, uh, clientelistic, and which has run its course. Uh, Now, at the same time, we are, and as as I will uh, talk about a bit in the end, in in a bit of of an in-between phase, because the old has died, but the new hasn't been born yet. And and between the old and the new, you are perhaps in the worst possible situation, because uh, you have rejected what was, uh, but you don't have anything new that is really worth keeping at the moment. Uh, and as I, as, uh, uh, as I think is apparent from anyone who's reading the book, uh, hopefully by listening to me also today, this is, of course, not just a Greek story. Uh, it is a story which, where Greece was the, the spark that lit the flames, but uh, it is a very much a European story and probably broader than that, certainly a Eurozone story, because Greece simply was the accident waiting to happen uh, in Europe. So let me start with an attempt to um, figure out where we are now. So where we are is three bailouts later. 
110 billion euro in 2010, the first bailout uh, that was uh, signed, and I signed it. And this is the heaviest signature I've ever put in my life, or will, I guess. Uh, 130 billion euro in 2012, and another 86 billion euro in 2015. Now, if you compare this with the Greek GDP, which is about 180 billion, it gives you a sense of the extent of international help to Greece. Now, these are all you shouldn't add this up because some of the first bailout went into the second one. So it's not a strict uh, adding. Uh, uh, we've also uh, had a mega debt haircut uh, of uh, 100 billion euro gross reduction. And then I say gross here because about 40 billion of that went into recapitalizing the Greek banks and bits and pieces here and there. So it's not a net reduction of debt of 100 billion, but still, even if it's half of that, it's 50 billion reduction in debt. It's the biggest debt uh, haircut in history. So we are uh, you know, ticking all the boxes for first ever uh, uh, globally here. Uh, and of course, this is a crisis that has completely uh, changed the political landscape. It has consumed four prime ministers, nine finance ministers. I was the first, eight more followed. Uh, Wolfgang Schäuble has met nine finance ministers, one after the other. I think some of his most interesting <coughs> meetings were towards the end, the, pr the, the finance ministers that came around 2015, who shall remain unnamed. Um, and we've been through four elections and one referendum. Um, uh, the elections, uh, two elections in 2012, one after the other, uh, two elections in 2015, one after the other, and in between those two, a referendum uh, that nobody understood why it was called, uh, and where overwhelmingly the country decided to say no. It wasn't sure exactly what it was saying no to, but it was no anyway. And then a week later, the government decided to say yes to everything. So uh, a, a, a very bizarre referendum, which uh, uh, at the end of which, of course, the government managed to win the elections again. So, um, so where are we in terms of the economy? Well, if you actually look at the macro picture, it's pretty disastrous. Uh, we have lost about a quarter of Greek output since 2009. GDP is about 25% lower than it was then. Um, remember the, the... What is it doing, turning around by itself? Um, the, 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 uh, the Great Depression in the US was pretty much similar to this. So we, that's the best comparison you can draw. The big difference is that in the US you had a V-shaped recession. Went down, went up quickly. In the case of Greece, you have a very long U shaped, and we're still there, down there. We're only now beginning an uptake. There was, we're actually in a bit of a double dip uh, because uh, we had uh, an uptick at the end of 2014, 2014. Then politics uh, yeah, you know, came back with a vengeance, and we're back into recession, and we're hopefully coming out next year. I don't believe for a minute the growth projections for next year, but uh, hopefully we'll be in positive territory. Uh, you have an unemployment which is close to 25%, and youth unemployment which is double that. Now, those of you in this room that are economists, and I gather there's many of those, know that the way we measure youth unemployment isn't really representative because it counts also people that are uh, studying. So 50% isn't really 50%, but still it is extremely high. And the only reason why you can have 25% unemployment and not have a completely collapsed country is because... In the south of Europe, uh, family and extended ties tend to kind of pick up the slack where the state isn't there. So the only reason why we have 25% and not people looting in the streets is because of that. Because 25% unemployment is absolutely horrendous and, and not uh, in any way acceptable. Uh, despite the haircut, uh, debt to GDP, the debt to GDP ratio is still at uh, north of 170%. And that's a very big discussion about what that really means, uh, and I will come to that, you know, uh, because debt relief is one of the big questions as, as we move forward. Um, uh, and I spent a, a, a large part of my time as finance minister and right after discussing the various aspects of debt and what debt sustainability really means, and I can tell you nobody really knows what that means, but anyway. And we have a non-existent banking system in the sense that it's been recapitalized four times. Uh, successive, the kind of brave uh, 
private investors, I don't know if there's any in, the, in this room, that put money have seen it go down the drain. Um, and uh, it is non-existence in the sense that it simply cannot extend the kind of liquidity that the economy needs to pick up again. It is uh, on drip feed. It's got uh, roughly, you know, edging up to 50% non-performing loans and has some serious corporate governance issues. I'm happy to come back to that uh, during the discussion. Now, I have very few graphs in the... Uh, but this is just to show you that, um, uh, you know, between 2000 and... 2000, 2000 was when Greece entered the, the Eurozone. So between 2000 and 2008, roughly, we were... The difference in debt to GDP between Greece and, and the Eurozone was pretty steady. We were much higher, of course. We were at 100% uh, even then. But we thought, uh, mistakenly, uh, that the... To the extent that the economy was growing, yes, it was high, but it was steady. But this was a, a kind of razor's edge solution because the minute the economy crashed, your denominator collapsed, so your debt-to-GDP ratio shot up to 130%. The dip going down that you saw is the result of the, of the debt haircut, the PSI in 2012-2013, and then it went up again. And now it's kind of at an inflection point, and then there's a number of very brave projections uh, following that in debt sustainability analysis done by the IMF and, uh, and uh, the uh, various European institutions. Next to it is the real GDP index, which, of course, poses a very interesting question. You, you have a perfect bell shape here, uh, but not the kind that we like in statistics. It's one where uh, in 2000 you start off, you go up and up and up, and then after 2000... Eight, because, of course, the collapse of the economy happened way before the memoranda. Okay. Uh, it, uh, the economy went into negative territory in 2008, and now we're pretty much back to where we were then. So, you know, there's a big question here. Should Greece have entered the Eurozone in the first place? Uh, I would leave that for the discussion, because I'm sure that this will be raised. Um, and, of course, the, the, the really disturbing picture of unemployment, where uh, uh, you have there a better picture than uh, in terms of GDP or debt, um, in terms of debt, rather, um, between 2000 and 2008, and then complete shooting up. And if you look at youth unemployment, even more. Now, the fact that it's kind of... Uh, uh, it stopped growing, and it's gone from 26 to 23, is, of course, positive, but, you know, Go tell that to the people that are out of a job. Is there any good news in this story? Well, yes, there is. Uh, Greece has gone through an absolutely dramatic fiscal consolidation. When I die, on my tombstone, there will be a sign that says, during his 22-month tenure as finance minister, he reduced the deficit by six percentage points of GDP in you know, a very short time, which has never been done before. And I really hope nobody has to do it again because it is extremely painful for everyone. So we went from an over 15% deficit uh, to GDP ratio to uh, somewhere between 2 and 3% at the moment. I'm rounding the figures because it doesn't matter. Um, from a primary deficit just above 10% to a primary surplus. So a massive Absolutely massive correction, which, of course, happened in a given time period, rather compressed, and had a much bigger uh, negative impact on the economy that it should, than it should have had. And part of the interesting questions is how that could have been avoided. We have all but completely wiped out the competitiveness deficit, because in 2009 we started with three deficits, a fiscal deficit of over 15%, a competitiveness deficit of close to that, an external account deficit, and a credibility deficit because uh, the government had lied about the, the statistics figures and nobody believed whatever we said. So uh, all these three have been pretty much uh, dealt with, uh, except, here a word of caution, uh, because we need to be honest, uh, when you're saying, when I'm saying that the competitiveness deficit has been faced, the truth of the matter is that this has come much more from the collapse of imports because of the recession than because of a resurgence of exports. So you have not had in this time this magic transformation of Greece into a dynamic export economy. You have had the collapse of the economy, collapse of imports, some uptake of exports, and that's how it rebalanced. So you're not yet in a a completely different environment that you would like to be. And you've had a 
an extensive structural reform agenda. And here I would like to say that it is uh, often misunderstood and underestimated the extent to which the Greek economy has changed in this time. By no means would I claim that we have solved our structural uh, problems. In fact, I will talk about that uh, uh, towards the end. However, you've had extensive reforms in pensions, in the tax system, which is still problematic, but much better than it used to be. Uh, in the way we construct a budget, it is embarrassing to say, but until 2010, the Greek state did not know how to do a budget, did not know how to execute a budget properly. It simply wrote some figures down and then it, it borrowed what it couldn't you know, get right in the figures. Uh, you have reforms in product and labor markets. You have opening up of uh, closed professions. You, it's easier to set up a business. It is less costly. Um, uh, it is easier for foreign investors to come in. Uh, you have a labor market which is less sclerotic than it used to be, and uh, reforms are continuing on this. And a privatizations agenda, which even though it has not achieved its targets, is very wide-ranging. Uh, and uh, hopefully at the end of it, there will be a, a more robust economy. So uh, by saying that a lot has been done, I do not mean to say that enough has been done. But I, you know, I... All I need to do is, is send you to OECD reports which uh, say that Greece has been the fastest reforming economy for many years, since 2010. And it is true. However, we started off as a big outlier, according to some people, with the last Soviet economy in Europe. So, you know, you start off at, at a place where you have an economy which is in dire need of reform. A lot has happened, but a lot more needs to happen uh, as we move on. Now, a word about politics. We've seen the complete implosion of the old political system. The party that I used to be in, PASOK, the kind of social democrats of, of, of Greece, won the elections in 2009 with 44% of the vote. We were the largest uh, center-left political party in Europe at the time. PASOK is now polling 4%. Uh, so, and its then Prime Minister, George Papandreou, has formed his own party. and He's polling 1%. So we're talking about a complete implosion of the political center. Uh, and uh, we have seen during this time the rise of populism. Okay? It's kind of, I guess, nice, not so nice to see that we're not alone in this anymore. Uh, it seems to be the, the, the rising tendency throughout Europe. But we, we again, we think we were one of the first ones here. And it's interesting that the populism here comes both from the right and from the left because the first offenders were the people that bear a lot of the blame, which was the Conservative Party that left the mess when it, in 2009 uh, and were the first ones to raise the populist flag uh, in, in once uh, we went into the bailout agreement. And then, of course, the radical left, which is now in power uh, in an unholy alliance with the populist extreme right. Um, we have a hollowing out of the political center. I, I use the phrase in the book, the arsonists are back, <laughs> because... Uh, you've had the Conservatives coming back in 2012 and now being the best hope for Greece following the radical left government, uh, but without really having reformed uh, themselves completely. And you have a very bizarre uh, experiment um, between, as I said, a, uh, an extreme left party which has become more moderate, uh, but one shouldn't take that too far, uh, Syriza, together with an extreme right-wing populist party, the independent Greeks, ANEL. Uh, and, you know, the question is, you know, what's binding them together? And the answer of what's binding them together is populism. It is the complete rejection, in theory, because in practice they're implementing a bailout agreement, uh, of everything that needed to be done in Greece over the last five to six years. And, of course, society. Because Greece is a broken country at the moment. Uh, you've had uh, seven years of uh, uh, initially shock, denial, you know, the five stages of grief, uh, disbelief, and eventually resignation as people realized that a lot of what they were being told was not true, uh, that the, some of the changes that were necessary were extremely painful, uh, that everybody had lied to them pretty much, uh, this has led to a rejection of the entire political system. All, all politicians are liars. I can tell you what, one of the most shocking moments that I had was in 2011 during the mass demonstrations. 
my office was overlooks the central square of Athens, and that's the favorite place of people to demonstrate, and the parliament is just beyond that. And so there were, between me and the parliament, it was full of people sort of chanting that I should jump off the window, and, and then turning to parliament and saying, let it burn. Uh, and that was a shocking sight to me, because uh, it's not very long ago, 74, that Greece became a democracy. And it's here he had a wholesale rejection of the democratic system. And among those people were people that are now in government, actually. Uh, these were not just you know, anarchist groups or Golden Dawn, because part of the implosion of the political system meant that a neo-Nazi party went from 0.4% to now be polling 10% in, in, in the vote. So, um, and you have a, a whole generation lost. And the real question here is, has this dramatic period led to self-awareness? You know, have we figured out why we're there, we got where we got as a country? Uh, because we're never going to get out of the crisis if we can't figure out why we got into, the, into it in the first place. Uh, and there I'm still uh, rather skeptical, I have to say. Uh, and uh, you know, the book's narrative, which is that Greece, you know, to put it in a, one sentence, uh, Greece was living beyond its means, had a broken political and economic system, and at some point, sooner or later, it had to crash, and it did with a thun. And then we took the least bad decisions of the very difficult set available to us. That's not a majority narrative in the country. That's a minority narrative. It is the standard narrative abroad. But in Greece, there's a different narrative, which is that Greece was pretty much doing okay. Then some people came in, they inflated the deficit, it's amazing, actually, that the statistics chief who cleaned up, who I hired to clean up the statistics, is now being prosecuted for that, for having allegedly inflated the deficit. And as a result of inflating the deficit, the IMF came in, and then the Germans came in to buy the country. This is, unfortunately, the majority narrative. And perhaps it is not anymore such a majority narrative, but it's still a, a very strong narrative in the country. And as long as it is... I fear a lot about whether we can overcome the crisis and move on. Now, let me try and, and um, broaden the lens a little bit and talk about Europe. Because it is clear that in, in, in 2009, Europe was caught like a deer in the headlights. We had created this uh, amazing... We had made this giant leap in European integration by creating a common currency in 2000. When we did so, we knew this was a flawed construction. You know, it's instructive to go back and look at interviews of people at the time. They do say, you know, we know that what we're doing isn't right in economic terms. It doesn't fit the basic optimal currency area theory. Uh, you can't have a common currency just on, on a common monetary policy. But it's the best we can do at the moment. We'll fix it as we go on. Well, we didn't. You know, everybody fell asleep at the wheel. And uh, everybody, the policymakers felt, well, it, it's working. Uh, markets are happy. Markets completely lost it. Remember, private investors were lending to Greece up until 2008 and even begin 2009. And even up to mid-2009 at, you know, 10 basis points above the German Bund. You know, they considered that Greece had the same risk as you know, 10-year ten ten year uh, German government bonds. And it cannot be just because Greece was not being completely forthright about its statistics because forget the deficit, you know, debt issues are, uh, you know, on Bloomberg. Everybody knows how much debt the country has issued. And yet, credit rating agencies were giving top marks to Greece when we were not AAA, of course, but still. So everybody lost it. And uh, 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 as a result... When Greece crashed first, because there are interesting questions about whether other countries could have crashed before Greece, uh, the, uh, first it was denial. No, no, this is a Greek issue. Uh, you deal with it yourselves. Just take measures, the markets will respond. Well, they didn't. Then when we realized, when our European partners realized that this was not something for Greece to handle alone, we hastily put together in a firefighter mode a bailout mechanism. May 2010. Then we realized that, yeah, okay, there's more, more countries that are, are in danger, so let's broaden this. Let's uh, 
make the bazooka larger. And then we started step by step fixing the institutional infrastructure with um, the steps towards fiscal union, timid as they are, and the slightly less timid but still not complete steps towards a banking union. Uh, so, you know, new toolbox and the evolution of EU institutions. One of the most fascinating aspects, which I think are very clearly seen in the book, is how institutions developed, how the European Commission in 2009 was completely discredited. You know, there was a reason why the IMF was brought in, because nobody thought the Commission knew how to do the job. Nobody thought the Commission knew how to do multi-year programming. In fact, they had never done it. The IMF had. They had the spreadsheets. They knew how to do this stuff. And then how the ECB responded. The ECB, the guardian of the temple, by far the strongest voice, aside from Berlin, uh, in the crisis, uh, with very strong views against, for example, debt restructuring, with very strong views that government should take responsibility and put up a bailout mechanism. Okay. Uh, but very, in its initial phase under Jean-Claude Trichet, very reluctant to sort of go beyond what it considered a very narrow uh, 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 framework and less reluctant afterwards uh, with Mario Draghi and his famous words, uh, you know, we will do what it takes, which basically ended the crisis. Well, they pretty much helped to resolve the crisis, but only because the other stuff has, had happened before. Uh, but it's still a German game. If, there's, if you ask me what is the one lesson that you've learned in these years, I would say that it doesn't really matter very much until you hear what Berlin thinks. And when Berlin changes its mind, and Berlin does change its mind. Uh, it took six long months for uh, the German Chancellor to actually decide that she had to ditch the no bailout uh, rule of the treaty, in a creative way, of course, and start telling the German people that it, this was not only a morality tale, but, you know, we had to lend because this is better for the euro and for Germany as well. Now, having, however, told the morality tale for many months, it was much harder for her to do that, as it was hard in 2012 uh, for the debt restructuring. Um, we have uh, in Europe, as you know very well, a, a long and difficult debate about the extent of austerity. One of the most interesting uh, book presentations I've done was in Berlin uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, where the environment uh, was very different from where I present the book in Rome or, or in, in other European capitals. Um, and, uh, of course, we, have, we are moving more and more towards intergovernmentalism. Horrible word. But basically, uh, the old way of doing things in Europe in a community method with a commission taking initiative uh, are long gone. Uh, it is now decisions taken by two or three governments in small groups um, uh, or decisions taken where France and Germany meet and then Germany decides. Uh, th these are uh, with the help of the Dutch and the Finns. I mean, this is how it is. Uh, and this is, um, uh, it poses very serious questions, uh, which I will come back to uh, as we see some broader, beyond Eurozone uh, developments. Now, what went wrong? Well, <laughs> where do I start? Uh, there are so many levels. Uh, obviously, in Greece, uh, I, you know, we tend to have a tendency in my country to not assume responsibility. At the end of the day, you know, it's our country and, you know, we bear the biggest responsibility for uh, letting it get to where it did. Uh, so I start with that. But having said that, we have massive institutional failure in Europe in terms of monitoring, in terms of having the right responses in time, in terms of taking political and not really economic decisions, uh, in terms of delaying decisions on debt restructuring, uh, you name it, it's there. Uh, so uh, in international institutions, you know, when I presented the book in Washington, uh, the main interest in the room was, did the IMF get it wrong? Or rather, how much did the IMF get it wrong? Uh, and should it have gotten into uh, the Greek uh, drama in the first place or not? Uh, in markets and credit rating agencies, because at the end of the day, uh, markets completely missed it in the beginning and then completely overreacted 
uh, we were at a point where in the beginning we, we were being told by analysts, well, you're not doing enough. You're not uh, reducing, you're not taking enough austerity measures. Uh, so your debt is going to be unsustainable if it's not already. So we took more measures. Then the markets turned around and said, well, you're now taking very many measures and your economy will collapse and you'll have social unrest. Uh, so it's not sustainable either. Uh, you know, so uh, we know markets are not rational. Uh, however, it is interesting to see how they completely under and then completely overreacted in, in, in this crisis. There are some very generic lessons here, which are almost management lessons, uh, which go beyond Greece, of course. Yeah, things tend to catch up with you. You know, if, you, if you're a country uh, with broken institutions or very weak institutions uh, and fiscal laxity, well, at some point, you know, you go beyond the point at which you cannot go any, any longer. And it crashes, and it crashes really badly. If you are a Eurozone uh, which, uh, with, a very shaky, with very shaky foundations uh, that defy some basic economic uh, uh, laws and uh, where you have a banking system which is... Uh, not integrated, uh, and it is uh, heavily reliant on government debt, and the nexus between governments and banks is, is very strong, then you will come up, and this is going to be exposed. Uh, then even if you do things right, you're not out of the woods, because at the end of 2009, beginning of 2000, we were doing the right things, all of us collectively, but we were one step behind. It was, at the time, uh, markets were looking for... a uh, uh, for a, a stopgap measure. They were looking for a backstop, rather. For, uh, they were looking for someone to come and guarantee, like in the US in 2007-2008, that Greece would not be allowed to uh, go bankrupt. And that guarantee was not there because Europe did not believe in this type of reaction. When it eventually stepped up to the plate, it was too late. So we actually had to use uh, the, the bailout mechanism. Time is expensive. I often tell people who are in negotiations... Uh, Take the first deal on the table, because if you wait too long, every successive offer is going to be worse than the first one. It took many governments too long a time to realize this in, Greek, uh, in Greece. And I think the, the classic case was in 2015, where the government took basically six months to show that it was negotiating, and at the end ended up with a deal which was massively worse than what it could have gotten in February, if it had managed to actually get over its ideological blindfolds and uh, sign sign up. Uh, negotiation is a delicate game. It is not a game of chicken. You know, especially when you're riding a moped and on the other side comes this big German truck. You know, you don't stand a chance. You cannot run negotiations as, as if it's you know some theoretic game theory. Some, uh, and again, I'm talking about 2015 here. Uh, it's disastrous for the country. It may allow you to then become an international rock star. But it doesn't really help the country. The, the cost is absolutely huge. Uh, and ad hoc solutions uh, are only second best. We, we kind of repaired the bicycle as we were riding it, but at some point you had to stop, you know, put it apart and put it back together. And we've kind of started doing that, but I think events have um, overtaken us. There's lessons on program design. Um, and here we could spend the rest of the day, of course. Uh, uh, you know, th there's, there's a question of the right degree of austerity. I mean, what is the optimal path? Did we follow an optimal path? Well, no. We followed a path that was consistent with the funding envelope. In other words, here's how much money there is. Here's, how much money, here's what your financing gap is. Here's how much money we're willing to put on the table from our Europeans, our European friends in the IMF. Well, you know, and therefore, this is the kind of austerity you need to be able to uh, get by with this kind of money. The IMF, interestingly, was the more rational player around the table. The IMF, which is often demonized, were the ones that realized that, you know, you can't do this in a very short space of time. But uh, took a back seat, especially in the beginning of the negotiations, because they were not putting most of the money up. The Europeans were. Uh, and this is why we ended up with a very short period of adjustment of a massive adjustment, hence a much bigger drop in output. The right uh, fiscal policy mix, balance between expenditures and, and revenues. 
many people think that this was a pro- these were programs overwhelmingly on the, on the revenue side. That's not true. The first program was 60-40 on the expenditure side. Then the second one was more balanced. And the third was overwhelmingly on taxes, which was th- it's, is the worst of the three in that sense. Uh, on the expenditure side, it had to be the first one because you had the pension system, which was completely unviable, had to be corrected immediately. You had the wage bill that uh, Jean-Claude Richet loved to show us in graphs how between 2000 and 2009 had gone up 130% uh, uh, wages per employee, whereas in Germany it had gone up by only 10% or something. Um, uh, There's questions about sequencing of reforms. In other words, can you do a such a difficult exercise of simultaneously massive fiscal retrenchment while opening up every structural reform agenda. In political economy terms, no, you cannot. You cannot be simultaneously cutting, certainly not not increase, simultaneously cutting wages, salaries, pensions, increasing people's taxes, and then opening up closed professions, reforming the labor market, opening up uh, 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 the product market and doing privatizations because you put everyone up against you. You have no coalitions to, to, be, to build on. You, can't, you don't have the time to convince the people this is actually coming, something positive is coming out of this. So, uh, but we were in a situation where we had to do both simultaneously and without understanding the severe issues of implementation capacity that we have in Greece. I often tell people Greece, and it's a very politically incorrect thing to say, Greece was more of a World Bank case than an IMF case. It needed and continues to need deep institutional reform with support from our partners over a long time to change an administration which is deeply problematic. And uh, this kind of inst- this, this type of it took a long time for uh, the your commission to, to realize this. Then they responded with an ad hoc f- uh, task force to help in implementation. The IMF provided technical assistance. This was all very useful, but not enough. Uh, people often think that this was resistance from the political system to reforms. Yes, some of it was there, but a lot of it was the, administ- the lack of administrative capacity, human capacity to, to put these things together. And then, of course... There's the debt question. I will come back to that. I'm, I'm leaving it hanging there. Uh, just briefly, lessons about politics. Uh, to me, the, the, the main lesson is the last one. And I think here in Sweden you have an interesting counterexample to Greece because you've managed to do some very difficult stuff in different periods of your time and to different governments. I don't want to sound party political. Uh, and uh, moved on. Uh, but there is a question of how much pain you can dish out in a democracy uh, in a very condensed time period. Uh, it's not a question of just getting the government re-elected. It's a question of keeping uh, so- coherence in society. Uh, and I think we're, we're, we're seeing the strains in, in, in more than, uh, than one country. But, you know, uh, one thing, well, one of the many lessons here is that, you know, you... Good policies is not necessarily good politics. I think that in 2009, 2010, we did the right thing. We, we were punished severely for it. In 2015, the government did the exact wrong thing. It was rewarded in the polls. Okay. So the two don't go in the same direction necessarily. Going towards the end, um, this is the time of questions, and then I'll say a few words about well, how we'll move on, and, and I'll stop and I'll open it up. Was this a Greek crisis or a European crisis? Uh, was this, this is a favorite in Greece, was this just a bailout of French and German banks? There's something in this, clearly, but that's a very reductionist w- view. I mean, yes, Greek and German banks were overloaded with uh, Greek government debt, uh, but you cannot claim that this was... That's what was behind the entire approach. I think it's a reductionist uh, way of looking at it. Should, could the first bailout have been avoided? Uh, another favorite one in Greece. Oh, you could have done this and avoided the bailout. Well, the, most of the adjustment had to be done one way or another. And the bailout could not have been avoided, to my mind at least, then. Perhaps if a couple of years later, you earlier you've done different things. Should Greece have been allowed to default? Uh, one of the interesting lines of discussion in the U.S. were people saying, you should have simply forgotten about the European Union, gone straight to the IMF, cut a deal with the IMF, and then had debt restructuring from the beginning, 
and you would have been all right. I will, if you want a discussion, explain why I think is that's f- deeply flawed as an argument. Should the IMF have been involved at all? Was Greece made an example? Yes, there is clearly moralistic overtones here. Uh, it was, uh, in certain parts of Europe, a morality tale. And we were you know, the perfect uh, example to, to, to make a morality tale on. Tina, I mean, there is no alternative. Were there other alternatives? I think uh, it is clear that uh, having seen a government that came to power, the recent one, uh, promising a completely different alternative without pain and failing to do so, I think uh, the answer to that one is, is reasonably. Uh, and could the third bailout, the one 2015, have been avoided? My answer to that is yes. One of the questions that preoccupies me the most is, what is it about Greece? You know, is it something in the water? Is it in our DNA? I mean, why are we the first ones to go under a bailout, and seven years later, we're still in a bailout? Meanwhile, Portugal came in, came out. Ireland came in, came out. Cyprus did the same. Spain, and we're still there. So what is it? And I think, you know, it's it's important to go beyond the, the facile answers, which I often hear even from institutions saying, oh, you know, you guys are unreformable, and look at, at some real issues. Uh, we started with much worse initial conditions. We were an outlier. Uh, what we suffered from during the crisis was a lack of political consensus. We have a broken social contract in Greece, and we don't have a political system that can actually agree on some basic stuff. Uh, unlike what happened in Portugal and Ireland. Uh, We did have our own internal problems and fatigue, and that showed uh, along the way. Uh, And there were many mistakes made also by European partners, including this incessant talk about Grexit, which made it impossible to go back to international markets, because if this is sustained, well, then... And I think the the, the best example of how a well-meaning decision can lead to disastrous circumstance was Deauville. For those of you that don't remember the details, 2010, October, November, uh, President Sarkozy, together with Angela Merkel, meet in Deauville in Normandy. They go on a stroll on the beach and they announce to a stunned uh, world that you know certain decisions which completely changed the nature of the crisis in the Eurozone. The basis of the decision was correct. Banks also need to pay. We all agree. Taxpayers cannot be the only ones to foot the bill. Check. They said, we need a permanent support mechanism in Europe. We need to build that. Check. Uh, We're going to have that ready in 2013. Okay. But for a country to go under such a mechanism, its debt has got to be viable. Sure. And if it's not, we can entertain debt restructuring. Problem. In 2010, November, you pre-announce that in 2013, if you're a private investor holding Greek, Portuguese, Irish, etc. bonds, you may get a serious haircut on your money. What do you do? The next morning, the market's open, you dump. And that's exactly what happened. Two weeks after Deauville, Ireland went into a bailout. Two months after Deauville, Portugal went into a bailout. This was a seminal turning point in the European crisis, which turned where to my mind at that point was a containable Greek crisis into a fully systemic European crisis. So, you know, good intentions, unintended uh, results. What if? What if Greece had defaulted in 2010? What if Greece had threatened to default in 2010? That's a favorite one. You know, if only you had threatened in 2010, they were overloaded with your bonds, you could have gotten a better deal. Uh, This is a very interesting. What if Ireland was the first to fall? Remember, we now think of this, of Greece as having ushered the European crisis. But in fact, the Irish problems, the Irish banking crisis, precedes the Greek crisis. And uh, Ireland went under at the end of 2010. We went under in May. If it had been the other way around, then perhaps the entire episode would have been seen more as a banking issue, and less so as a fiscal profligacy issue. So you would have been talking about different crises. Uh, debt restructuring, what if it was part of the 2010 bailout? Would things have been very different? Uh, what if debt was restructured right after the bailout? And, of course, 
should Greece or what if Greece had exited the Eurozone in 2015? I'm on purpose not answering these because I, I want to leave some of them for the discussion. Uh, two more slides and I'm done. Uh, and forgive me for taking a little bit more time than I'm supposed to. What now? Do we look forward and, and forget the past? Uh, as I said in the beginning, we need to agree on the narrative. Uh, you, you can't, you know, people say to me, well, you know, why are you rehashing what happened in 2009 and all that? You know, what's done is done. Let's look forward. My answer is to no, because if we don't agree on what happened, then we're going to do it again. It's, it's not, if we, if we think that we didn't get it wrong back then, then why are we going to get it right this time around? So, to my mind, you, you still need to discuss the nature of the crisis in Greece and what happened to be able to move onwards. There's some main agenda items here. Uh, debt relief is the first one. And as you know, there's a, a, a very heated discussion at the moment uh, between the IMF on the one hand and the European institutions and Germany on the other hand on whether there should be debt relief and when. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions on that. Uh, uh, but just let me premise this by saying, yes, debt relief is necessary, but it's not sufficient because it's as much about institution building in Greece than it is about getting a better deal on debt. And of course, the main question uh, is, you know, is there a growth paradigm for Greece? You know, is a small country in a corner of the Mediterranean uh, can it be part of a common currency uh, with a hard uh, currency and be somehow competitive? Uh, my answer to this is yes, uh, but under some very specific conditions, which I'm happy to go. And um, <laughs> and if a bigger agenda of, of, of questions here, are we having a stability union or are we hoping to get to some kind of a fiscal union in Europe. Uh, in Berlin, uh, one of the most difficult points in the discussion is when uh, I pointed out that we need to have a symmetrical discussion when we talk about competitiveness in Europe. Because it is impossible to have a union, a Eurozone, with uh, a country consistently running very, very high uh, uh, external surpluses uh, at the double digit at the moment. It's just, it just won't work. So we need to somehow face this up. Um, how do we see the ECB evolving here? The ECB has gone to the edge of its mandate uh, because of a personality there. But you know, uh, we can't let the personality run the, the institution in the sense that we need to figure out whether we want an ECB in the German mold, or we want an ECB closer to the U.S. Fed? Uh, and what kind of uh, arrangement does that require? Do we need a global debt deal? You know, if you look at Italy, actually over the next 10 years, Italian debt looks much worse than Greek debt. Sorry to say. It's got a higher interest rate, more difficult to repay, uh, much shorter repayment periods. Over the medium term, Greek Greece looks worse. And the headline figure, of course, for Greece is much worse. But, you know, there's a... There's a a case can be made for a more broader uh, uh, debt deal. Uh, and if this is my final one, um, it's tempting to look at Greece in the context of a Eurozone story. But I think some of the reactions during the Greek crisis are part of a much broader narrative. We are in an age of populism. Uh, we are in an age where we're, we're, we're seeing the results, the unintended results of globalization hitting countries throughout Europe in particular ways, and we're increasingly seeing this in elections. 2016 was an annus horribilis in terms of election results, and 2017 promises to top that. Uh, and uh, it will be interesting to see whether it's going to be a make or break year where the Eurozone looks, the, the, sorry, the European Union looks uh, at itself and uh, its foundations and figures out whether it needs to do some radical reform quickly if it is to survive. And I will leave you on that very optimistic note. Thanks very much. <laughs>
uh, Greece was on the front page of the Financial Times yesterday. Uh, as well, there is a new bailout coming up. And the question is, A, can, does Greece live up to the, the uh, demands in the, in the sort of austerity package? And B, will I am the IMF still remain, remain in the Troika, which won't be a Troika if they leave? Uh, I was just wondering if you have any comments on the present situation. If you look at the fiscal uh, agenda, uh, the Greek government is ticking the boxes. Some of these boxes are really not very good. I mean, I, I, I have a problem with the fact that the adjustment is overwhelmingly on the revenue side. Okay. Uh, because the economy is tanking. I mean, it's, uh, uh, we are in an in a environment where you're hitting diminishing returns in terms of what you can get. But it is taking those boxes. It is less successful in terms of doing the structural reforms, um, but it's getting there. So I think that the review will close. I have no doubt that it will. Um, it's just that you always need to understand when you're looking at Greece that uh, more time is necessary for this government to actually close a deal because it has to be seen to be negotiated. It has an internal audience which requires it to be seen to be putting up a fight, even though in the end it's going to sign down on everything. Mm. But it cannot do this immediately because then it's as if it's simply you know, giving in. So it's got to be able to say to the electorate, well, we tried our best, but you know, uh, we couldn't do anything more. We, we got the best possible deal for you, even though it's a worse deal than it could have been otherwise. So it will close. The real question, of course, is... Um, the review closing, and the review closing requires the labor reform uh, changes to be made. It requires the medium-term fiscal strategy to be agreed with the 3.5% uh, primary surplus target for 2018 on. There's a question about what happens 2019 to 2020. Uh, the real question is, is, of course, the debt relief. And if you look at the, uh, the positions at the moment, uh, it's very hard to see how they're, they're reconciled. The IMF insists on immediate substantive debt mm. uh, relief. And uh, Germany, the commission ag is kind of agrees with the IMF but cannot say it too loudly. Uh, and uh, Germany says, yeah, we have a decision, but there's no rush. Now, the mathematics on the short term are on the side of Germany in the sense that in terms of uh, debt repayments, and debt servicing, the next 10 years are not bad. However, that's being short-sighted because you do need to send a signal beyond those 10 years and remove that uncertainty from an investor horizon. And that, that's why you do need something more on debt relief than what Germany is suggesting. Mm. But I actually believe that there, is, uh, there will be a compromise in the end. And the compromise will involve the full implementation of the short-term measures this decided. That will reduce the debt by anything between 15 and 20 basis points of GDP. And at the same time, some more explicit detail on the medium term. This, to my mind, will be enough for uh, uh, the German Chancellor to be able to go to the Bundestag. And it will be enough for the IMF to say, OK... A uh, condition on all this, uh, we are fine. Okay. I have a question in mind in my mind whether this will involve the IMF putting money in the program or not. But that's, uh, that's really not important because actually the IMF money is much more expensive. So uh, there's no reason for the IMF to put money except if the German uh, Bundes Bundestag requires that. And speaking to people in Berlin, it wasn't clear to me that this is an absolute requirement. Okay. And the Troika will remain a Troika, you don't think? It's actually a quadriga at the moment. Because <laughs> <laughs> the ESM is there as well. It's a quadriga. Okay. But they won't leave the... I do not think so. I think within the IMF there's a very big discussion. You know, I mean, this has been a traumatic experience for the IMF. Yeah, and yeah. the board uh, and the non-European countries uh, every time complain vociferously. Uh, I think the IMF would be perfectly happy to leave, to be honest, mm. you know, and continue in a monitoring role. But I don't think we're there because I don't think that uh, Germany would be able to have the IMF completely out of the picture. Okay, thank you. High time to leave the floor, please. Uh, my name is Shostra. I had over the last over the last twenty years, I've been to Athens about <coughs> five to six times a year. I follow closely what you told us, and I must say, 
it was very knowledgeable and excellent uh, presentation you made. However, there are two points which you didn't touch very much upon. Two points which has been dealt with all these Swedish investors I brought down and said, no, we don't want to invest in Greece. And those politicians I brought down, one former prime minister, former minister of finance as well, another minister of finance, two th issues. And I'll explain it to, the, to all of you by a small little story. This was a couple of years ago. Uh, you had a kind of monopoly, a license monopoly for transports between uh, Thessaloniki and Athens, made that the transport cost with trucks uh, in that relatively small distance was the double for oil, for instance, bringing oil from Rotterdam to Thessaloniki. And the Troika forced you, so to say, to take a law, to dismantle all this. That was good. I then happened to sit next to the Minister of uh, Transport, uh, a month later, and the Troika, at the time called that, uh, was uh, on, on, uh, on the doorsteps uh, to, to the, his uh, ministry and the rest. I said, why, why don't you implement the law now that you have taken? Oh, he said, no, you must understand that. How? Oh, well, you have been a lot here. I've met you a couple of times before. Yeah, sure, but still, please let me know. Well, he said, you know, those people, those who transport uh, the oil, they are my friends. Thanks to them, I'm in this position today. And on top of that, you know, it's not only me to sign a law in the ministry, having been decided upon the parliament. There are another seven signatures. And if I sign, you can be absolutely sure that somebody else amongst these seven people not to sign. And this brings me to the two, summing up the two questions. One you have touched upon, the other, and uh, that's the efficiency in the administration, that you implement things which you have decided upon. And the other point is corruption. Unfortunately, this country is so corrupt that, that you as Swedes cannot imagine to what an extent. I'm sorry to say also people in your own government fill their pockets. And so have a number of people are doing. And this makes that Swedes, for instance, we do not dare to go into Greece. People say, no, they want to have a permission to build a hotel, for instance, things that you would like us to do. No, we dare not. Please let us know. How do you tackle these two major points? Thank you. Thank Please. you. Um, okay. Implementation. There is often... And I think, at, as you said, I touched upon this. A distance between legislating and implementing. Uh, I have my own stories here. Uh, I passed a landmark law on opening up closed professions, uh, only to discover, you know, six months later that nothing much had been done. Not, for, not because uh, of other reasons, but because all the administrative decisions below the law were not being signed and therefore nothing was being changed. Hence, uh, if you look at successive reviews of the bailout program, you will see more and more detail on individual policies. So whereas you had one line, open up closed professions, then you had a whole paragraph, you know, pass this degree, do that degree. And so, so um, I'm not debating what you're saying. It is true. Uh, uh, however, I would argue, and I think the, the best uh, 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 testimony on that it comes from the, from the Troika itself, that a lot has been happening in helping implementing and opening up areas which, are not, which, were, not, which were completely closed. Truckers. Uh, simple things like the fact that uh, hotels were not allowed to send... Uh, people w could not rent minivans at the airport because the taxi drivers were not allowing them to do so. You know, in many senses, uh, Greece has changed in those sense. And I in, in parts of that, it is now better than a number of other southern European countries. So, uh, I okay, Italy perhaps is not an example here, but we have opened up much more than Italy has in service sector provision. Uh, that, again, as I, I think I was very clear to say that, you know, a lot of work needs to be done. This is why, in any case, over the next foreseeable future, Greece will be in some kind of a conditionality policy. You know, the, the bailout will finish, but the, 
the actual, uh, uh, and this is both necessary but also problematic, the actual conditionality policies in order to make sure that certain things happen will be there. And that's the best guarantee that I can give to a foreign investor in the sense that there will be somebody following and making sure that things happen. As a Greek who used to be a politician, because I now call myself an author, not a politician, this is a very sad statement to make because it means that the internal political system cannot do it by itself in its external help. And uh, uh, But that's how it is. And uh, until we assume our responsibilities, it is useful and re- uh, 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 comforting to a foreign investor. And there have been some of these coming in uh, to be able to do that. Now, we are in a in a difficult, politically speaking, period because the kind of back and forth on foreign investors uh, that is happening at the moment is seriously problematic. As uh, Minister of Environment, after my stint as Finance Minister, I signed off on a major investment uh, in the north of Greece, in the, the environmental permit for that, only to see that one year later it was blocked by the government that followed. It went to court, it was cleared in the court, now it's back on, we lost two years. And we, th- those investors, a Canadian company, are our worst ambassadors now because they say that we, you know, we came in, we put in you know, hundreds of millions and we're still in problem. Now, your question about corruption is, of course, a, a, uh, um, I, I won't deny it because it's there. Um, what I will say, however, is that often we are overdoing it in 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 putting it up. In other words, you do not need any more to go through and pay public officials to get the licensing done. Partly because the licensing has been simplified and partly because it has become more difficult for these people to take the, the bribes because it has become more costly for them if they are uh, discovered. By no means would I say that the, it's not there anymore. And in local authorities, I would argue that it is easier, easily, more easily done than it is done centrally. However, I think it is correct to say that also on this, there are fewer examples than there used to be. And that includes the political system itself, which was in a completely different place back in 2009, 2010. And it is less so. Not because people have changed necessarily, but because we've put together the kind of checks and balances which makes it much harder. I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, in 2010, we legislated, this is the Papandreou government, uh, something which in many other countries is obvious, but which did not exist in Greece. We post on the web every single government decision of any that involves expenditures of any type and of any height, which means that you can follow the, the money. Okay. Uh, this doesn't solve all corruption, but it certainly puts a break on the ability of people to use public money in ways that are not quite conducive to public policy. So, a long uh, answer to a, a, a very good question, which is to say, yes, it's still there. Hopefully, it's better than it used to be. Okay. We are running out of time, but we have time for in that case, could I ask you a favorite, little one of the questions sort of, I'm thinking a lot, but you said that youth unemployment was sort of close to 50%. We have a group of students here from the Stockholm School of Economics with us today. Sort of what happens to that generation? Do they leave Greece? That has happened in Spain to a large extent. Yeah. Uh, and sort of what sort of long run problems does it create? I, I often go and present the book in various towns around Greece and uh, one of the toughest moments for me is when you know some young person gets up and at the end of the presentation and says give me one reason why I shouldn't emigrate mm. and I'm stumped you know I, I, I don't have a good answer to that I, and I say go but please come back when we create the conditions for you uh, and in fact, you've had a, an exodus of skilled people, uh, the IT guys, the doctors, the nurses, the engineers, uh, they're leaving. They're going to the UK, they're going to Switzerland, they're going to Sweden, they're going to, and they get jobs and they learn a lot. And I'm hoping that just as it happened 
in previous cycles, because we had Greek emigration in the 60s and then people came back, they will come back once the economy picks up again and once we assure them that they have a level playing field. Because they all say, we love the fact that our salaries will double and we have security and we have a better work environment. But we actually love the country and we want to come back because you know, life is good in Greece in the sense if you can afford it and if you, you know, it's, it's a good way of life. So I'm hoping they will come back. And I, but that's, not the, that's only a very small part of the answer because obviously uh, uh, you need to deal w- with it in place. And uh, I do not understand why successive governments have been in, incapable of putting together active labor market policies that manage to bring some of these people to the skills that are necessary and bridge the gap between demand and supply. Yes, it's a problem of demand. The economy is not growing, the force is not creating jobs, but it's also a question of uh, of skills mismatch, which we're mm. not addressing properly. Yes, sorry. Mia? Yes. Um, uh, my name is Mia Huna Vransian here at SNS. Uh, you had a very big, very important question uh, at the end of one of your slides, which was how much pain can a country take, and how does that relate to the future of democracy? And uh, it was a question mark. Given the picture you have given of the situation today, what would be your answer? How, what, what is the threat today? Uh, I think this is a question that goes beyond Greece. Uh, and I think it, there's a very delicate balance to be found. A number of countries, mine first, uh, require some serious reforms, not just of the economy and of institu- but also deep, more deeply institutional reform. For example, I worry very much about the lack of independence of uh, so-called independent authorities in Greece. I worry about uh, meddling with the judiciary, which is happening. I worry about attempts to control the media that I'm seeing in my country, which reminds me more of Hungary's Urban and Greece's Erdogan than of a modern European country. So... Uh, Reforms are necessary. The question is, how do you find that delicate balance between externally imposed reforms and ensuring that people see you know, some hope? In the case of Greece, I think it's very clear, you need to take your foot off the brake, not of the structural reforms, but on the fiscal side. You need to let the economy breathe again. This is why debt relief is important, by no means by itself enough. But you need to get the economy growing and make, you know, People understand that something will, you know, will come out of this. But as I, get, as I said, it's broader than Greece. If you look at Italy, we have a referendum in a week. Uh, following that, it's possible we have a collapse of the government. And then you have a, a very difficult situation in terms of who's leading in, in the polls. You have elections in, 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 in other countries. So um, I, I don't have a, a convincing answer to this, but th- I think we need to wake up to the fact that Structural reform and institutional reform is necessary. It needs time. But at the same time, you need to be able to give people hope and need to address specific problems. If you're talking to a median family in Greece at the moment and you try to explain to them that uh, the reforms in the health system are making it more productive, they will turn around and say, well, actually, you know, I go to the hospital and I, you know, I don't find the kind of basic services that I would require as a citizen of a modern country. Same with education. So we're now scratching the bottom of the barrel. You need to give some uh, cushion for these people. If, if democratic governments that do the, the difficult stuff can survive, otherwise you give a voice to uh, the extremes. Well, we, we've run out of time, I'm sorry. Could, very short, very short. <laughs> I have often been asked by my friends in Greece, politicians, business people, if I do believe in Greece. And my answer is always yes. And they said, how come? Well, you are so professional. I mean, the people, the individuals, like the gentleman that's in here, are so professional, well-educated, hard, very hard working. Sometimes we hear the Greeks don't work. They work much harder than we do here. So one day it will be back. And I absolutely believe that. <laughs> Thank you. That was a nice way to round it off. If any of you should feel like, hmm, maybe I should read that book over Christmas, uh, there are a couple of copies outside. 
if you are interested, you may even get them signed by the author. You never know. George, Happy Papa Constantino, thank you very much for thank coming you here. Everyone. Thank you.